started for today. Welcome to our lecture number 22, I think. A couple of announcements. Your homework eight is due tonight at midnight. Um, your project five, Ghostbusters, is due on Friday at five. And then your homework nine will be released, released pretty soon. We'll cover some of the material we cover in lecture today. And we'll be due on Monday. Another announcement. This Saturday is Cal Day. And with my lab, we always have an open house. If you're interested in meeting some of the students in my lab or meeting our robot, um, stop by between 10 and 1 on Saturday morning, third floor of Satar Jedi Hall. Um, we have all kinds of things, including a robot that ties knots. It can also fist pump you, high five you, and sometimes hug you. If you're early enough, we also have a word puzzle, and if you solve a word in the word puzzle, you get to win a robot t-shirt. So lots of awesome things to participate in. Any questions about logistics so far? Another big logistical thing, the final contest has been released. So this is your chance to bring together a lot of things learned in the class and compete with your fellow students. This is how it's set up. You would be either red or blue. You have two agents. Let's say you're red, you're ghost on your side. You're supposed to collect food on the other side and bring it back. It's a cap capture the flag kind of setting. And there's a timer also, and when time runs out, it's being checked who brought back the most food, or if you bring back almost all the food before time is over, you also already win. It'll follow your Project 5 setting, where you don't have perfect information of where the other agents are. You'll have to estimate where they are based on sensory information. We have a ranking, just like we have for the Mini Contest 1 and Mini Contest 2. So you can submit into the contest.cs188.org webpage and request games against other teams. We also have all kinds of extra credit. If, this, if the fun isn't enough for you, points um, might get you there. Um, extra credit based on the final ranking. The deadline for that is Sunday the 24th. If you're first place, the entire class will get two points on the final. This is finals out of 100, so it's two points out of 100 out of your final. Um, your second or third place, 1.5 points, then 1 point for 4 to 10, and 0 0.25 points for any staff bot that you beat out in the final rankings. There's about 5 or 6 staff bots, so for that you're just competing with staff, not with other students. In addition, to encourage you to start early rather than late, um, Starting this coming Sunday, we'll have nightly rankings and there'll be extra credit based on those two. Note that these are not cumulative. You cannot get like, extra points every night. You can one time earn those points for being in the top 10 or top 20. Let's see, anything else here? Well, I think that's it for the, for the final contest. I encourage you to start early. Your chances of being in the top 10 or top 20 on Sunday night are much higher than any future nights because very few people will be participating on Sunday. There might only be 10 teams. So even if you just submit the baseline bot that has almost no AI in it, you might already make it. Um, so think about that on Sunday. All right, any questions about the final contest? And today we're going to look at uh, deep learning, first lecture on deep learning. Thursday will be the second lecture on deep learning, though there are a few things we still have to wrap up on perceptrons before we actually get to deep learning. So first let's revisit linear classifiers and look at a few things that we haven't covered yet. Also, quick review of pieces we'll need going forward. So what do we do with linear classifiers? You had some input, let's say an email. You turn it into a feature vector, which was number of occurrences of each type of word, things like that. And then a linear classifier might decide whether it's spam or ham. Do the same thing for digits. Turn a scan digit into a feature vector, and then 
weight vector times feature vector to determine what kind of digit it is. This was actually inspired, this perceptron set up by how human neurons work, in that human neurons have a cell body, a nucleus here, and there are dendrites. Dendrites are the inputs to the neuron. There could be high, well, a lot of firing coming in on an input, or no firing coming in, or medium, anything in between. Then based on all these inputs on the dendrites, the nucleus computes something and then sends that signal out on its axon. And with a perceptron, that's all that happens. In the real brain, this would be part of a huge network with, let's say, hundreds of billions of neurons that are connected in a network. But for now, we've just looked at one in isolation. So let's re we'll, we'll put this in, in bigger networks soon, but let's review what one in isolation can do. Inputs are feature values. Um, each feature has a weight in a national neuron that would be the strength of a connection. And then the sum, the sum of the weighted feature values is the activation, which we then feed out. And so we might have an activation of this type, weight vector W in a product that, with a feature vector F of X. Okay? We might also be writing this going forward as W transpose F of X. Same thing. That's just another way to write it in a product. Two column vectors, we transpose one of them, becomes a row vector, and then can multiply them together. That's an inner product. Okay, so the activation is positive, we output a plus one, negative, we output a negative one. And so this is effectively what this looks like. Let's look at some application of things we can do with this, and then we'll build on top of this. So web search, very important application. You want to find something on the internet, there's so much stuff out there, you don't want to browse page by page by page, you want to be able to just search and have the thing return to you what you're looking for. Okay? And so this could be straight up just a query you enter or it could be a complicated question, anything that you might want to find out that you think the information is out there. So let's see if we can formalize web search as something similar to a classification problem. So let's think about this. You type in Apple computers, then you could say, well, the input is Apple computers. The classification I want to get out is a label. And the label is which web page is the best web page to look at if somebody searches for Apple computers. Of course, it's a little tricky because we've seen perceptrons with multi class, and multi class perceptrons, you have a weight vector per label. So if you did it naively, you naively did multi class perceptron here, you'd have a weight vector per web page out on the internet that you would then multiply with this turned into a feature vector to determine which one gets the highest score. And that's very difficult to do because if you need to learn that many weight vectors as there are um, web pages, it's going to be very ineffective to learn them. So we need to do something a little more clever so we have less parameters than a weight vector per web page. So we're not going to do exactly classification. What we're going to look at is using a perceptron-like approach, but rather than for classification, for ranking. And so the trick we have to play is the following. When we get a query, for example, Apple computer, we're going to build a feature vector for each combination of query and web page. So this is a web page about apples on Wikipedia. And we're going to build a feature vector for the combination of the query Apple computer and this web page. And I'm going to do the same thing for this other web page here in combination with the query. So what are we looking at here? What is this feature vector? This thing here is page rank. We've seen that when we looked at Markov models, page rank is how often a random web server would visit a certain page, just following links on existing pages. This thing here is the number of times Apple occurs on the page. So it's a word count. This is how often computer occurs, and then this is how often the combination Apple and computer occurs in sequence. Okay? Then same thing over here, same feature, same type of feature vector computing the same way, but now based on this other web page. And so now each page, based on the query, we can compute a feature vector, and we're going to use that feature vector in combination with a weight vector to determine which is the best page. So the question now is, if we look at 
some weight factor w inner product with f of x comma some web page because now the feature depends on the web page too which will have the highest score this will depend on the weight factor and we hope we can find a weight factor that makes sure that the page we want actually has the highest score okay so we can do this like we did for a perceptron you could have a bunch of inputs x to see training data you have a query right and then another query another query another query so we start with let's consider one query x and we have a set of candidate web pages y so we look at for each one of those we can compute the combined feature vector between input x that's the query and the web page y and we have one weight vector w and we can make a prediction. See which web page maximizes the inner product between the weight vector and this feature vector. If we're right, the label says yes, this should be the highest ranked page. We keep the weight vector. If we're wrong, we change the weight vector just like we did with the perceptron where we say, well, we want the correct one, y star, to score higher. So we're going to add f of x, y star to the weight vector. And we're going to subtract out f of x, y, because we want this y to score lower than it did, all right? So this decreases score of y, and this one here increases the score of y star. And then we we'll keep cycling through our training data at some point, just like in the regular perceptron, but now we'll have a ranking perceptron that's trained to return, hopefully, the correct web page when we enter a query. So, this is what the update would look like. Let's take another look at another, another example. So, Pac Man. Let's take a look at Pac Man Apprenticeship. Actually, let's set it up on the slides for a second. So, here's what we're going to do instead of Pac Man running search, we're going to have Pac Man learn from a human player. So, what happens is Pac-Man is in its world, a human player plays for any given state you can in principle compute a Q value for state action pair so the action here A corresponds to what otherwise would have been the web page Y and so we want a ranking over actions, we want to find out which is the best ranking action among all the actions available to us and so we can do the exact same thing here now. We will have a human player play. Whatever action they took is considered the action A star or the label Y star if you want to go with Y. And other actions are the wrong action. And as we collect enough data from a human player, we get enough examples of state and corresponding action. We get to update the weight vector until hopefully it points in the right direction such that for a given new state, we get the correct ranking over actions with the correct action being chosen as the highest ranked one. So, if there's a correct action, A star, we want it to be the case that the score for A star is higher than the score for any other action A that's available. Let's take a look at this in action. So, what we have here is we're watching a human player who is kind of a medium expert player. Data is being recorded. For every state, the corresponding action is recorded. A training set is built that way. Okay. Then here is another second full training set where the human player plays again. We see Pac-Man come out victorious again. And all the state action pairs are recorded as um, training examples. Now from all these training examples, a perceptron was trained, a ranking perceptron that ranks actions for a given state. And now we're going to play just using the perceptron. There's no search here. There's no minimax, no A star, nothing. It's just for a given state, 
is then computing the feature vector, multiplying with the weight vector, and that's it. Let's take a look at what it learned. So feature one is when you're close to food, that got a positive weight. Close to scare ghosts, got a weight of zero. Other things coming through. <laughs> close to scare ghosts, got a weight of zero. Why? Because there were no scared ghosts in the game. So there's never a, a feature value that was non-zero for scared ghost. And so the weight never got away from zero. Close to ghost got a negative weight. It's not a good thing. So it learned it the correct way. The score, increasing score is good. Close to pallet apparently has a negative score. Not sure why it learned that, but um, maybe it's offset by other things. And the number of scared ghosts did not get a non-zero weight. Why? There was never a scared ghost who couldn't learn anything about that. Let's take a look at how these weights play out. So it's all autonomous now, no search, just straight up learned with a perceptron from the human player how to play. Comes out victorious. Now we can actually change how the human player plays. Here is a more expert player than the previous one. Then let's collect another data set from this more expert player. Uh, it'd be good to think about what you think the weights will be that this perceptron might learn. Where it might get positive weights, negative weights, based on the demonstrations that are shown here. Okay, let's inspect the weights. Close to food is good. Close to scared ghost is a good thing, close to ghost is not a good thing, then score is a good thing to increase, close to pellet, actually this power pellet is, is a very positive weight now, it likes to get close to the power pellets, um, the bias is zero, the number of scared ghosts, that's a feature too, and it's weighted positively because it's good to have many scared ghosts. So let's take a look at how this plays, this is just running the classifier, the per ranking, per ranking perceptron to play for every current situation, deciding on an action, and then repeating. So this is a reflex agent actually. Remember very first lecture we talked about reflex agents and how often they're not that great? Well here's an example of how through learning you can actually build a pretty good reflex agent. You can actually teach the system whatever you want to teach it. So let's take a look at another example. Here we have a non-expert playing, and we're collecting data from the non-expert. <laughs> collect some more data from the non-expert. We can look at the weights. They're weights that reflect a non-expert type play. And then if you play, learn based on that, you just suicide the way the non-expert demonstrated things. So this is a very interesting way actually in practice to often have a system make decisions is to collect data from a human making a lot of decisions and then running machine learning to mimic what the human would do. Any questions about this? Yes? So if you run the same like, training data on the, uh, the, to build the feature vector, it wouldn't necessarily like, mimic whatever the training data, it wouldn't create bias, would it? So would it create bias if we train this way? If we trained it like on one set of like games, like you gave it the same game every single time. So the question is really, if I can rephrase about overfitting, should we worry about overfitting? Is it possible that if a human player plays in a particular way, that now when it's faced with a new situation, you might not have seen the right data? And actually there are, there are good examples of that. For example, let's say you are teaching your car to drive and you, you let's say you grab your iPhone, put it on the dashboard, and then you wire it up to your brakes, to your throttle, to your steering wheel. You say, I'm gonna have an autonomous car and I'm just gonna like show it how I drive, right? In fact, people at CMU did it back in the 80s, a project called Alvin, right? And so what they did is they actually hooked up a, had a human drive, collected all the data, and then learned the mapping from pixels to steering actions. 
And the problem they found is that the, when the humans drive too well, all the data you collect is right in the middle of the lane. And then if ever something goes wrong in practice where you're somehow not in the middle of the lane, that will not be covered by your training data. And now because it's not covered by your training data, um, you don't make a good decision. And so when you do this, when you try to teach a system by demonstrations, you need to be really, really careful that you actually have a diverse set of training data and cover the entire space. So that's just something really subtle here. And if you want to learn more about, more about this, I recommend the, the work on Dagger. Something very subtle going on that is, let's say you train a system from human demonstrations you're never going to match perfectly what the human does. And the reason you're never going to match it perfectly is because if you match perfectly, you're probably overfitting. And so you, you always will stay a little bit away from matching exactly what they do. That also means when you're in a new situation, you're acting, you're probably not taking exactly the action they would have taken. It's slightly off. The consequence of that is then, because you took an action that's slightly off, you'll be in a slightly different situation than the human would have been in. And so as a consequence, your training data distribution does not match your test data distribution. And this work on Dagger actually looks specifically at how you should actually do something beyond what I just showed to you, where you first you play the game, or you, you demonstrate whatever it is you want your car to learn to drive. Then you start interleaving actions of your learned system with your own actions. And so if the learn system makes you deviate a little bit, you'll now show your own actions on how to get back on track. And if you do that for a while, then you'll have corrected for the, that kind of variation that you might be worried about, and you can get guarantees about how this will work in, the, in real situations you'll encounter in the future. Whereas if you don't do that, actually the guarantees are much more limited. Okay. Now, so far what we've looked at is finding linear classifiers. It's always weight vector times feature vector. And so in feature space, essentially draw a linear boundary and we would never get a boundary like this when we looked at so far in feature space. Now, maybe sometimes that's not good enough. Maybe a linear boundary is not gonna cut it for you. You need a nonlinear boundary. What can we do? So here's an example where it works out fine. You just have one feature, it's just the X coordinate and the red stuff is on the left, the blue stuff on the right. Your decision boundary can be somewhere here. You even have some wiggle room there and you're all set. But what now if the data set looks like this? If you come up with a linear decision boundary, this would be W times X plus B, bigger than or equal, bigger or smaller than zero is how you make your decisions. Well. There is no way to get these all correct because you kind of want not more in one direction, more in the other direction. You want to single out what's in the middle. Any thoughts on what you can do here? So we'd like to single out what's in the middle, but with the current one dimensional feature X, there's no way to do that with a linear classifier. So one thing we could do is say, well, can we find a nonlinear classifier? Um, often how this is done actually is by augmenting the feature space. So what you would do is you would say, well, you know, I kind of want to single out that stuff, blue stuff in the middle. What if I design a new feature? So I augment the feature space with an extra dimension. And in that new dimension, the blue stuff stands out from the red stuff. So for example, I can use an extra feature, x squared. Now there's x and x squared. And now I can draw a separator there that could be straight and separate red from blue. Okay, So you can do this in general. Whenever you have some data, not just one dimensional data, higher dimensional data, here's 2D data, and you say, well, I kind of want to separate the middle stuff from everything else, you could introduce an extra feature that is, let's say, small in the middle, large when you're not in the middle of the set of data points, and then you can just draw a plane right through it in three dimensional space separating red from blue. One question, of course, is as you do this, you might come up with different ideas. You might have a first feature set, a second feature set. You might train your perceptron. You might wonder, well, which trained perceptron should I work with? 
with the one with feature set one or feature set two? Um, well, if you have two feature sets, effectively what you do is you train on the training data for each of the feature sets, two separate perceptrons, and then you'd look at your holdout data and just see which one does better on the holdout data. Okay? So you can just look at whatever does better on the training data, because if you do that, actually what will happen is you'll always favor the one that has more and more features. Because the more features you introduce, the easier it becomes to get all the training data right, and you'll actually start overfitting. And so when, as you introduce more features, make sure you carefully track on your holdout data whether these more and more features actually help you to generalize to new situations. Of course, a little tricky. I showed this to you, and we might ask you questions like this, right? Okay, here is some data. Um, can you come up with an extra feature? For example, x squared plus y squared in this case that will separate red from blue. But often your data is very high dimensional. It might be text, it might be pictures, and so forth. It can be very difficult to come up with the features that actually are going to make this work. And so what we're going to look at going forward is how to deal with that. And let's look at, as a running example, we'll look at computer vision. Well, so let's say we want the computer to process images. And we want the computer to understand what's in an image. For example, there's a face over there. How would you build a system that can do that? We now understand machine learning, how it can work. And so we understand that if we come up with a good feature set, like the best feature would be something that says, is there a face or not in this part of the image? That's an amazing feature. Unfortunately, that's already solving the problem we're trying to solve. So probably need something else, something that maybe relates to do I see something that's somewhat shaped like a face, but what does that mean? Are there some edges on the outside and then more, more edges on the inside, maybe some circular type things for eyes and so forth. But how do you build a representation that from an image turns that into something like that, that's your feature vector that you can use, right? Turns out a lot of research has been done on this. In fact, for years and years, this is what a lot of computer vision people did their uh, research on. And one of the best things people came up with um, is this thing called HOG. And this is a HOG feature descriptor. Stands for histogram of gradients. Let's think about what's going on here. So the idea is, you want to build a classifier for what's in an image. You want to understand what's in there. From having a bunch of labeled examples where somebody said, there's a person in this image, there's a cat in this image, there's a dog in this image, and so forth. Right? And when you see a person in one image, the person in the other image can look very different. Even the same person could look different, because as you change the viewpoint of the camera, the pixels will change, things will shift over. Uh, lighting conditions will change, pixel values. Um, if it's a different person, things will change. If even the same person wears the same, wears different clothes, it will change things. They might be in a slightly different pose and so forth. So a lot can change. You somehow want to capture the essence of there being a person in the image rather than capturing one very specific occurrence of a person in an image. And so to deal with lighting variation, and slight changes in viewpoint of the camera, what people realize is that rather than looking at the actual image, if we compute an edge image, so rather than looking at this image directly, turn it into an edge image. That way you're better invariant to lighting condition changes. But what about now if the person moved over a little bit or changed their pose a little bit? The edge image would still change drastically. All the pixels in this edge image would likely change. So the next thing people do is said, well, from this edge image, let's turn into this histogram of gradients. What that is, is for each little region in the image, so for example, there's a region over here, corresponding region over here. You look in that region, and you build a histogram of what the edges are in that region. And then instead of keeping the actual layout of the edges around, you just keep the histogram of edges around. And so that now means if things shift a little bit, the histogram will almost not change. If edges turn a little bit, the histogram will not change that much, and so forth. And so you get a more invariant representation to what's in the image. Here's an example. Anybody can guess what's, what was in the original image? Over there. Bicycle. Bicycle. Well, why a bicycle? Well, we see the general shape of a bicycle here, right? So let's take a look at the actual original image. There it is. Could we tell it was going to be this specific bicycle from looking at the histogram of gradients? No, no way that we could say it was that bicycle. That's actually a good thing. 
Because if we use this representation, it could capture a lot of different bicycles. And so if we learn a classifier that works on the representation on the right, it'll work a lot better to generalize than if we train directly on something shown on the left. You say, well, how did they come up with this histogram of gradients? Well, the way this happened is, well, first people realized these things about lighting, shift invariance, pose changes, and so forth, and then they started cranking away at this. And they would come up with some kind of histogram of gradients. They would train perceptrons or support vector machines, see how well they do on test data. And they would realize sometimes it doesn't work so well. They'd say, well, instead of having 16 bins in my histogram, how about eight bins? They run it again, see what happens. They say, what if instead of 16 by 16 patches, we use eight by eight patches to compute our histogram? What if we um, use a soft histogram where you don't hard bin, but you kind of, if you are histogramic things, you partially contributed to both neighboring bins rather than just a hard assignment to one bin. And you play all kinds of games like that. You evaluate on data, see what works better. You keep going, going, going. If you do really well, you write a paper about how this is better than what people did before. And people wrote PhDs and PhDs doing this. And if you went to computer vision conferences back in the early 2000s, you would have seen a lot of really clever ideas on how to build bester, better histograms of gradients. It could be called hog, sift, daisy, um, just many others. It's an art. It's very hard to get to work, but if you're an expert, you could do this. Now, because this takes so much work, and you just did it for, let's say, recognizing objects and images like bicycles, what if now it's an object that could change shape, like a human? You have to kind of rethink the whole thing. What to do about the fact that arms can move around? Are you going to build histograms, or are they going to be histograms where there's some notion of you're allowed to move the histograms around in certain ways? then you get deformable parts models. And so there's a lot of thought that has to go in all of this to make this work. Um, that's what people were doing. It required a lot of domain-specific expertise, a lot of domain-specific effort. But in parallel, there were also some more pure machine learning efforts going on where people said, you know what? All this stuff people come up with is just computation. They're going from an input to some new representation of the input to then training a classifier on top of that. Can we actually just learn the first part too? Why are we only learning the last part? Why aren't we also learning what the right features should be? And that's what deep learning is about, what we'll cover the rest of today's lecture and next lecture. The beauty here is if you can get deep learning to work, you don't need domain-specific expertise, you just need deep learning expertise. You can go from your deep learning expertise to get things to work on images, to get things to work on speech recognition, to get things to work on yet something else. And in fact, that's what people are doing these days, where the same people might actually be the experts or getting the state-of-the-art results in multiple domains rather than needing an expert specific to that data set to be able to achieve state-of-the-art results. And also, it just requires a lot less effort as you get new data, you just rerun your deep learning algorithm and it figures out the features for you, and there you go. Okay, so how does this work? The basic building block is still a perceptron. So this is what we've been looking at so far. But now we're gonna puzzle this together, multiple of those. So how about we put something together like this? What could this do for us? Okay, let's break this down. Over here, we still have our classifier, perceptron with three features as input. We have some weights multiplied with the features that come in. But rather than having hand-designed the features, these features coming in here are actually coming from their own perceptrons. So what could this do? Let's say you were trying to recognize something as simple as uh, triangles, right? You want to recognize whether there is some kind of triangle in the image, something like this, let's say. Then, for example, this one here could detect whether or not this thing is present. This one could detect whether or not this thing is present. Same thing for this guy over here. So you could start building things where you detect parts of something in an image and then together you check if everything is present, then you might actually decide there's a triangle there. Uh, for another class, maybe you need to detect more edges. For a square, you might need to detect four edges instead of three. You need like another output there for a square. But the idea here is that rather than needing to spend a lot of effort on deciding what the features are, this block of computation will do that for you. 
I haven't told you how to find the right weights. Because of course, it depends on the weights that sit here, what features you find. And it'll be critical to have good weights there so you get good features. But in principle, this block of computation can do that for you. No reason to stop with two layers. You can build any number of layers, chain them together. And so what you can do now is like you have some kind of primitive features being computed over here in the first layer, but then you can combine them. And in the second layer, you get more complicated things you're able to detect. And this keeps going till at the very end, you might have a detector that effectively works for a person or a dog or a cat and so forth. You might ask, well, how much benefit do you get from this? Because um, I should admit, things are going to get a little mathy the rest of this lecture and um, next lecture. So let's first take a look at what the benefit is in terms of performance. ImageNet. ImageNet is a standard data set. There are a million images in there, a thousand categories. So cat is one category, dog is another category, car, and so forth. A thousand images per category effectively. So somebody went through and labeled that. It's actually not that hard to do. You could run a Google search for cat, then take the top ranked thousand images and just get rid of the ones that are actually not cats. Maybe you need a thousand one hundred because there are a few wrong ones in there. And Google finds those by people actually typing things on their web page and saying, my cat is so cute today. And then that's how it finds the images of cats. So you can do that. You can build a data set like that. Fei-Fei Li's group built that data set, then held back other data that was also images of cats, dogs, and so forth. But those images were not released to the public. They're held on a separate server. You get the million images that are labeled. You train your deep network or something else, depending on what you're doing. And then you submit your system. And so this is 2010. This is error rate. So lower is better. And we see that in 2010, the best submission into that server, which was holding the test data, got an error rate of about 29%. This was with traditional computer vision. We see actually a little better afterwards. We see this kind of ishing down. People are getting like a better hog, a better sift, stuff like that, like that improves it a little bit. Then in 2012, Jeff Hinton's group over at Toronto, in fact, Alex Shevsky and U.S. Escobar and Jeff Hinton, free author collaboration, built a deep neural net that was trained on these one million images. And here's where they landed. And so it's a big leap forward. If you see how this was trending at the time, this wasn't going forward very quickly, all of a sudden leap forward. At that point, of course, a lot of people switched to this approach. And so 2013, everybody except for this guy over here um, switched to deep learning. And not only do we have a leap forward, but also acceleration in progress. Okay. Might say, well, is this unique to speech? Um, uh, is this you need to uh, images? Not really. Speech recognition, same thing happened. People use traditional approaches, switch to deep learning, and things accelerated tremendously. What is this deep learning thing doing? Well, we saw the picture, right? It's somehow from the data figuring out what the features should be and then be able to do better than you can do when you hand engineer features because it's really hard to hand engineer those features. It turns out easier to let the data speak for itself. You give your, you have a much more complex classifier here. We give it enough data, it's able to figure out the pattern and learn something better than you could hand design. Yes. So what would you put in at the initial feature? So here, the input here is actually pixels. So no engineering anymore at all. They're just inputting pixels there. A question there. That's a very good question. So how do you interpret this, right? You look at this, let's say you build your self-driving car. You were driving your deep neural net, learned this great set of weights and it agrees with you. And then you're like, well, but what is it really thinking? What if it's like not thinking at all and in the right way? And actually people did experiments like this. So there are a few things you can do. Let's say you're wondering, what is this feature here close to the end? What is that thing? What you can do is you can actually cycle over images in a clever way and find the image 
that maximally activates this feature over here. So you say, what makes this feature maximally active? You can do this in two ways. You can go over all your images and just sort them by how, how much they activate this thing over here. And then you see real images and you say, okay, I guess images with, I don't know, uh, a pedestrian crossing seem to kind of activate this a lot. So this must be a pedestrian detector that's sitting over there, right? Um, another thing you can do is you can actually just directly optimize and choose yourself whatever pixel values you want to put there. And then it'll generate an image for you that maximizes activation. That's often harder to interpret what shows up there, but that's something you can do too. Another thing you can do, people play tricks with this, is things like, well, do I really trust this thing, right? You can have test data, right? Uh, hold that data, see what happens. But you can also do things like, well, if it classifies it as a cat, and now I have my image classified as a cat, and that's what I want, can I change a minimal number of pixels in the image such that it now thinks it's a horse. And you can see how many pixels you have to change to make that happen. If that's only one or two pixels, you're probably not gonna trust this classifier all that well. It means probably your training data didn't have good coverage, somehow it didn't learn the right kind of pattern from your training data. You need to be worried because two pixel changes are never gonna turn a cat into a horse, right? And so there are all kinds of things people do. <coughs> bless you. A lot of the research is about exactly trying to better understand what these things are doing to then make them better, but also to understand whether they're good enough for certain application or not. <laughs> questions here, yeah. Does it determine the number of perceptrons per layer? So question here is about the structure. Like, how many layers do you want? How many perceptrons do you put in each layer? Um, that's an art. You try things, just like otherwise you try different feature sets, you try different architectures. It's also, there's literature, of course, you look at what other people have done, what's been successful for them, and then you might use something similar to what's been successful for them. So for example, the one here, AlexNet, that's a particular architecture that was put forward in the Shisevsky, Shisevsky Hinton paper in 2012. And so a lot of people at that point started using AlexNet or kind of slide variations on AlexNet, but use that as their starting point to design their architectures. And so it was a very particular architecture they used that was cleverly chosen. So the truth is some of the feature design efforts switched to architecture design efforts. Um, and leading up to 2012, actually, the huge debate tended to be people who were pushing this deep learning approach would say, hey, it's great, we can, we can learn everything. And then other people would say, no, 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 no. You are still doing the same thing we're doing. You're just hand designing architectures rather than hand designing features and hand designing features is the way to go because it's about things we understand whereas hand designing architectures how do you know whether it's a hundred layers or ten layers or like a thousand per, per layer or two thousand per layer that's a very abstract decision to make and uh, so the people who did the traditional work would say we're gonna beat you to it because you have to solve this abstract kind of design problem and we're solving this like oh Light can come in this way or that way, so a feature should be more this or more that. Um, what ultimately happened is that, as you can see here, people who design architectures seem to have had a much easier time getting good architectures than people designing features by hand getting to features that are comparably good. So it's been an empirical finding. But until 2012, it would be huge arguments, discussions, and people would say, no, you're wrong, we're going to be first, you're going to be first. Um, and the jury has now decided, at least for now, that clearly choosing architectures is easier. You can also automate it, right? You can write a big loop or, or spawn multiple processes. You, you, know, you run on 10,000 machines on Amazon's EC2. You try 10,000 different architectures. You see which one comes out best. Of course, I also check your, on your holdout data, of course, not just on your training data. Another question there? That was my question. Same question. So, actually, let's take a short break here. After the break, let's start looking at how we can find good parameters for these networks. All right, let's, uh, let's restart. Any questions about the first half of lecture? So one of the questions, okay, go ahead. In the, in the background example, you had, like one of the features was bias. What, uh, what was that? 
So for the Pac-Man example, one of the features was bias, and that is what that corresponds to is often when we uh, look at things like uh, perceptrons, we might have W times f of x plus b. And so the weight, this special weight here, b, is kind of is the bias weight, and it, it tends to favor certain actions over other actions. Um, this is unlikely to happen in a Pac-Man environment where north, east, south, west are probably equally important, but if it were an environment where going east was kind of the dominant thing you should do, and if nothing else is, is there, all features are zero, there's nothing, no evidence for anything, you might be biased towards going east, and east might have a, a high bias. Um, sometimes it's also set up as, you set up your weight factor as essentially w, and you add b to it, and you do times f of x, and then you add a one, which is the bias feature here and then you incorporate it in your weight factor. So you can either keep it separate or you can incorporate it in your weight factor, you just need to add a feature that's always one. Um, either one is done at times. Yes, question? Is that a way to try to overcome overfitting or no? Um, the, the best way to overcome overfitting in these scenarios is to do multiple things. First thing is, you make a choice. When you choose your feature set, when you choose your architecture for a neural net, you make a choice. You put in prior information over what kind of hypotheses you're likely to find by doing by making choosing your features or your architecture. And so you might want to choose multiple ones, train on multiple ones, see whatever does best on the holdout data. The other thing you might want to do is something called early stopping, which we saw in one of the perceptron slides towards the end of that lecture, where as you're training, your training accuracy goes up and up and up and up, but then at some point your holdout accuracy starts dropping because you start overfitting your training data. So you're not just training fully, you're actually, what you're doing is you have a bunch of architectures, you train on each one of them, improving training accuracy, but at the same time monitoring holdout accuracy, and when that starts dropping, you stop the training, and then you compare for which one is the best. So that's the standard way to, to fight overfitting. Um, there's other things you can do, like try to keep your weights small, but that's almost the same as early stopping, because your weights start small and then as you do more updates, they'll get bigger and bigger and bigger. Another question that came up, oh, go ahead. Yes, so for the Pac-Man example, what we did is we had this thing over here. So for a given state, we would compute the feature vector for state combined with every possible action. So we, we would compute W, F, S, North, W, F, S, South, W, F, S, east and then w f s west this would give us four scores whichever one scores the highest is the action we would pick of course it depends on the weight factor and that's why there's a training mechanism a perceptron training mechanism to ensure that we actually make the right decision here and so this this corresponds to a multi-class perceptron where you have we want it always to be the case that the right action scores higher than the other actions. And so as we go to the training data, we would check for this for each training data point, we would check whether the right action scores higher than the, this is kind of a, technically there's an S missing here in the feature vector. Um, you would check if indeed the right action scores higher. If not, then you would do weight vector plus the feature vector for the right action minus the feature vector for the action that used to win to decrease the score of that one. Okay, so another question that came up during the break is when you set up these neural nets, do you introduce any kind of bias where you're kind of favoring maybe certain kinds of solutions, right? And the answer is yes. Whenever you choose something, whether it's hand design features, whether it's a linear decision boundary versus maybe another type of decision boundary, or an architecture of a neural net, you're introducing prior knowledge, your prior knowledge. When you work directly with designing features, you introduce a lot of prior knowledge. You say, I think histograms of edges are the thing that we need to look at. 
That's great because if you're smart about what matters, you can introduce that into the system. What's the downside of it is once you introduce that and you constrain it, you don't have your raw pixels anymore, you've turned them into histograms of edges, information is lost along the way too. And by introducing that prior information, while you might help the system in some way, you're also constraining it in terms of what it can still do. And so the reason there's this crossover around 2012 here is that when you have a very small amount of data or a small amount of compute power so you cannot process a lot of data, introducing prior knowledge is a good thing. You can use a lot of information that you know about the problem in your features. And so then with a small amount of data, you can still do something reasonable. But then once you have enormous amounts of data, which tends to be a regime we're in these days, enormous amounts of compute power so you can crunch through all the data, it's better to leave things more flexible and let the network figure out on its own what it should do with those pixels to make the right decision. And so a lot of it here has to do with more data, more compute power, allowing these deep nets to do better than the prior systems. In fact, deep nets have existed since the 60s. It's just at that time that we're not so successful, partially because there was some, some trickery you need to invent that wasn't invented in the 60s, but also to a great extent because there was not enough data, not enough compute power, to actually leverage the flexibility of these networks. And you were better off at the time putting in more prior information and then training something simpler that your computer can handle for which you have enough data. Okay, so we want to find the weights here. Whenever you change any kind of strength of a connection, any weight, you'll change what this is computing. You can think of this as a very flexible computer. And the way you program this computer to make a decision is by changing the weights in the network. And we want to find a good set of weights and we're not going to find them by hand by just thinking about them. We want the data to tell us what the right weights are to do the right calculations for a given input image, activate whether it's a dog or not, and so forth. We've actually seen something for this. Lecture five-ish, um, we looked at something called local search. What was the idea there? You start wherever. You have some weight factor, whatever it is, that's your weight factor. Then you say, well, how good is this weight factor? You can use this weight factor to classify every image in your training set. You can compute a score. That's how good it is on your training data. Then you say, well, what neighboring states do I have? Well, let's change the weight factor a little bit. Repeat this process. If it does better, that's a better weight factor. Let's keep it. If it does worse, let's discard this change and try again. Right? That would be a local search. You look at small changes to your weight factor, try to find something better. There are some properties, though, of this kind of thing that actually make it not work so well in practice. And the big issue here is plateaus and local optima. What do I mean with plateaus? If you look at this network over here, if I make a small change to the weight, let's say I make a small change to this weight over here, it's not often going to make much of a change on the output. In fact, I can make small changes that have no effect on the output because there's no training example where that small change to the weight actually affects what you predict, right? Because it's all about whether we reach a certain threshold. Do you ever change whether you reach a threshold of zero or not for any training example there? If not, that small change in weight has no effect on your training accuracy. Even if you somehow reach the threshold on some training example over here, how about in the next layers? Does anything change over there as a consequence of that? Again, a lot of thresholds available. If none of them are reached, nothing changes. And so those, that's what the plateaus look like. Small changes in the weights actually typically have no effect on your result. That's a big problem, because now if you look locally around your weight vector, you're looking around, everything looks the same. Nothing gets better, nothing gets worse, no matter which direction you go locally. So that essentially looks like you know, this area over here, but almost everywhere. You can also have local optima. It could be that you th there's nothing better locally, like um, this peak over here, but actually there's a much better, better peak over there. How do you ensure you don't get stuck in those? When we look at this, effectively what we're trying to do in local search, think of it as you're on a mountain, it's so foggy you can't see anything at all. You don't know how the mountain is set up, but you want to reach the top. All you get to do is kind of feel around, like if 
front of you, next to you, and so forth. You can find a direction that's more up, take a step in that direction, you repeat. That's local search. You don't get to look ahead and see, oh, the top is over there, I should go that way. No, all you get to do is look locally as to which direction will improve things. And of course, these plateaus make it really, really hard because now you can walk in any direction and where is the good direction you don't know. Now, if you're doing this on an actual mountain, it might not be too bad. Actual mountains um, are on a two-dimensional surface, something above a two-dimensional surface. When you work with these neural nets, typically you have about uh, a billion parameters. So you're working in a billion dimensional space, or in almost every direction, nothing changes. Still, you want to realize in which direction you could go a little further so that things will start changing. Really, really difficult to do. <clears throat> Completely impractical the way we've looked at this so far. So, what's the problem here? Like, we look at classification accuracy with a little bit of math here. So, this is our accuracy on Let's say training data, what is that? We look at each training example, I indexes over training examples, and we check whether the sign of W transpose F of XI matches the sign, negative one or positive one, of the label that's associated with it. And whenever, whenever this is equal, we get a one, otherwise a zero, and this then averages um, our correctness. And so this would be 100% if we always correct it, predicted the correct label would be 0% if we always predicted wrong. The problem, of course, is that any small change actually does not have much of an effect. So let's say you're looking at some training data. We have some crosses here, another cross here. Let's put the origin over here. And maybe we have some circles over here. Let's say we have a current weight factor. And we want the weight vector to point in a positive direction, so to be aligned with the positive examples. But right now, our weight vector points, let's say, um, C points this way. Okay? Pointing that way, this is our current W. That's great. We will actually have a decision boundary. It's medium grade. Let's put it that way. Decision boundary will look something like this. So get most of them correct, though that one little plus at the bottom right, we're not getting correct, okay? See, what if I make a small change to the weight vector? Small change. Well, okay, let's make a small change, see if anything is better. You would say, probably wanna wiggle it in this direction. That, that's a better thing, right? But actually, if we now look at the separating plane, still, this one over here will be classified wrong. It's still on the wrong side of the decision boundary. I should need a pretty large change, probably all the way till here, before you actually get that one correct. So the problem is that locally we don't get any signal. Any small change is not doing enough. You might say, why don't we look at global changes? If you're in a billion dimensional space, the best you can hope for is to do something local, where you say, can I locally improve things? Because globally inspecting things is just too big a space. So we're bound to do things locally. And so we're realizing with this perceptron kind of measure of accuracy, we're actually not getting anywhere locally, not enough signal. Intuitively though, if we look at this picture, going in this direction is the right thing to do. We should rotate in that direction. So what's wrong here or making this not work is the objective we're looking at here. We're looking at training accuracy. We're looking at how accurately do we classify the data as you need to go all the way till you get something right before your score improves. You don't get any incremental points for just going in the right direction. You need to go all the way there before you get an increment. So we need to change that. And so let's take a look at what we can do. Let's say for y equal one, we score with w transpose f of x. Y equal negative one, we score with negative w transpose f of x, okay? This is a lot like the perceptron. This is essentially the multi-class perceptron boiled down to, to two classes, happen to have opposite weight vectors. Now what we can do is we can soften the decision boundary. We can say rather than saying it's either prediction of one or negative one, let's predict a probability of positive one or negative one based on these scores over here. Here's how we can do this. We can say the probability of y equals one has to be high whenever w transpose f of xi is high. And so we have a e to the w transpose f of xi over here. The higher W transpose FXI, the higher that score will be. The I here is typo, let's drop this. 
Then same thing here. For negative 1, we will do the negative version of that. Now to have probabilities, we need to normalize. You could say, why don't we do something like just W transpose F and negative W transpose F? Well, there's a few reasons. If we exponentiate, we always get positive numbers, so that's helpful. We're turning that score into a positive number for each one of them. If you have a very high score, it'll become a really high positive number with exponentiating. If you have a low score, a negative score, it'll become a really low number. And so we're kind of making it more extreme, right? And so what you see here then, if let's say this score was maybe, who knows, 10, and this one was maybe um, then negative 10, you then end up with a e to the 10 over e to the 10 plus e to the negative 10 as your score. If you make a slight change to w, the probability of negative one and positive one will also make a slight change. And now we have a smooth thing. If you look back at the drawing we had here, if we looked at, if we change that weight vector just a tiny little bit and rotate it closer to this thing over here, that'll actually increase the probability of getting that thing right. It'll still most of the time be wrong because it's in the wrong side of the decision boundary, but it'll more likely be correct. And so the score will go up and we do better, right? And that's key. So rather than using this objective over here, we're going to be using this objective over here, the product of the probabilities of the labels given features and weight vector. We actually use the log of the probabilities and then we have a sum, but essentially the same thing, just numerically better conditioned. So the nice thing about this is now we have a smooth objective small changes in the weight factor will result in small improvements or actually not improvements, worsening of what we want. Okay, so our perceptual network now becomes a neural net where we have these soft activations over here rather than negative one plus one decisions being made. And now any small change in the input or in any of the weights will result in a small change at the output and we can now start locally wiggling around with our weights and see which direction makes it better. Do this for the big ones too. Okay, so what's our status? At this point we've come up with a objective, the log likelihood of this weight vector. It changes smoothly with changes in W, um, but we still have to figure out how to find a good W. Okay, something hopefully a little better than just wiggling around a little bit, finding something better and repeating. We want to maximize this. It turns out in optimization, when you try to optimize scores, almost invariably people try to minimize. So for the remainder of this lecture, we're actually going to look at minimizing this thing over here. Maximizing log likelihood, same as minimizing the negative log likelihood. Same problem, just happens that all the terminology around optimization tends to be around minimization rather than maximization. So we're going to be minimizing this thing over here. Okay, let's start thinking about that. So here is a objective, G, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to minimize G over choices of W, right? W is living here. Well, of course, we can look at this and we can say this is going to be over here, but keep in mind, for a billion dimensional function, you cannot visualize this. You can only visualize up to 3D in any reasonable way. So, billion dimensions can just plot it and then pinpoint where the best spot is. In fact, it would be very expensive to plot in, in that kind of space, even if you could, because there would be a lot of points to be plotted. But to build some intuition, let's start with a one-dimensional example. And so, let's assume currently we have a weight W0. That's our starting point. What we can then do is we can evaluate the function at W0 plus H and minus H. So a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left. So we can evaluations over here and over here. Remember, we're minimizing. So we see the negative H, uh, the positive H is actually good. This one, we want to go to this point over here, and then we can repeat. Now, it's of course a question of how do you choose H, but actually what we're going to do is a slight variant on that. Rather than choosing a point a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, we can look at the derivative. What's the slope of the function locally? If we can compute the derivative, it'll tell us whether we should go left or right. So we compute the derivative, derivative of g at w0, which is the limit of this quantity over here, which will tell us, well, the derivative is sloped 
This way, it's a negative derivative. We're trying to minimize, so we should move to the right. Okay? Now, the, the thing with looking at a one-dimensional example is like it's very different from a billion-dimensional case. And the fundamental way in which it's different that in 1D, you can only go either left or right. Only two options available. So let's take it up one notch here. Let's go look at 2D examples. Now, there are infinitely many options in which direction you would go because it's a continuum now. It's not as big as billion dimensional, but it actually starts getting to the point that there are infinitely many options in which direction you would go. So here's a function. Again, we can still plot this at this point, and we know the minimum is something over there. Um, often we'll look at it from above with contours. So this is the surface, but here is the contours, and that's often an easier plot to work with rather than the surface. Because the surface is really a 3D thing, and we're plotting it actually in 2D, which makes it kind of awkward to plot that accurately. And so this is often what we'll work with, and so we want to end up at this middle point over here. This would be your coordinate W1, this would be your coordinate W2, and then this would be your GW. Okay, so what would we like to do? It'd be nice if you could go down the steepest direction, right? That's locally the best thing you can do. You say, what's the steepest direction? Let's take a step in that direction, repeat. That's actually what happens here. So here's a function called x instead of w's, but you start here, you kind of take the steepest direction, repeat, 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 end up at the minimum over there. Okay, so that'd be great. That's a good choice. Um, but how do we find the steepest direction, right? What is the steepest direction? In at a given point. Let's think about that. So let's write this out because it's actually pretty mathematical. Um, so what we want to find, we want to somehow, for our function g of w plus some change delta, find the delta such that we're minimizing this, but we need it to be a small change because we, we essentially want to look locally what is the small change that will minimize this? That's the direction of steepest descent. So we'd say, okay, we find something where delta one squared plus delta two squared is smaller than or equal to epsilon for some small epsilon and minimize this, okay? If the change to w is going to be small, then we could just as well use a first order Taylor expansion. What is the first order Taylor expansion? It's the local approximation of the function, so we would say, well, our, so first order Taylor expansion says we can instead look at min over delta still with the delta one squared plus delta two squared smaller than epsilon of G evaluated at W plus then the derivative of g with respect to w1 evaluated at w times delta 1 plus the derivative of g with respect to w2 times delta 2, okay? So we're just saying this is a two-dimensional function. If you think of it as just a function of w1, then this is how we'll change. If you think of it as just a function of w2, this is how we'll locally change. And then, of course, it's a function of both of them, so it's a combined change that we get locally around this point W that we're currently at. Okay, so this thing here has no delta in it. So really, the only thing that will affect what minimum we find will be these two terms in the back. Let's remind ourselves of something. Let's say we try to solve a problem of the type minimize over all a such that the norm of A smaller than epsilon. All right, so it is the same as saying A1 squared plus A2 squared smaller than epsilon. Same thing. I want to minimize A transpose B. Okay, let's draw a picture. Here is B. Here's the origin. We have to stay inside an epsilon region. We need to find an A that lies in this epsilon region that minimizes this quantity. Okay, what is this thing? Well, that's the inner product between A and B. So if I, for example, picked A in this direction, effectively I get A projected onto B, this length here, times the length of B, 
would be the quantity we get. What's going to minimize this? Well, first thing, what will maximize this? Maximize this will be to align A with B. This here would be the A that maximizes it. To minimize it, we need the opposite. So the A that points this way is the A that minimizes this. What is this A? This A is equal to negative B, because the opposite direction of B. But then we can only be epsilon large. How large is negative B? We don't know how large that is. But we know it's supposed to be epsilon large, so we multiply with epsilon and divide by the length of B. And so this is our solution for this problem over here. Okay. This means that for this problem over here, which is essentially the same problem, where we have essentially, in this case, A is equal to delta, B is equal to this vector, dg, dw1, dg, dw2, right? So we find that our best delta is equal to dg, well, let's actually just call this thing nabla g, or gradient of g, then we have delta is equal to gradient of g, negative of that, times epsilon over gradient of g, okay? So we found our steepest descent direction. It's the negative gradient. It's the negative of this vector over here. That's the direction that's going to make us descend the quickest. All right, let's put this in um, typeset format. This is our solution. The negative gradient rescaled to be a small step. This is the gradient. And we take the negative of that. That's the direction which we're going to step. OK? So here is our algorithm that in general, if we have an n-dimensional space, n-dimensional weight vector, we would compute the derivative of our function with respect to every one of the weights. That's our gradient vector. And we step in the negative direction. So here's the algorithm. You initialize with some weight. Then you loop. The weight gets updated to be modified by taking a step in the negative gradient direction. How far in that direction? Alpha, that's a learning rate. It's a tweaking parameter. Don't make it too big, don't make it too small. Um, here's a crude rule of thumb that you might use. Um, in practice, also, what will happen is you essentially run a bunch of those. You have a command center, something like that, and you just say, OK, alpha, this value, this value, this value. You see for which one of them your objective goes lower and lower and lower, which is what you want. OK? So what does this look like? Let's say you're on this, working on this objective, and you're trying to minimize. Well, gradient descent, what will it do? Well, the gradient points in this direction. Now, depending on how big a step you take, you might end up somewhere, a pattern like this. You might say these steps are maybe slightly too large. Who knows? Hard to say. But actually, what you see here is something that comes back and back and back if you run gradient descent. It's our first algorithm, but it's slightly too naive to actually work well. What's happening here with this back and forth thing? Well, the way this function is set up is this kind of narrow valley and very steep walls next to it. And so as you move, you jump to one side, the other side of the valley, back and forth. You say, well, why can't I adjust for it? Is this really going to happen? Well, if you're in a billion dimensional space, some directions are going to be steep. Some are going to be not steep at all. You will have this contrast between very steep directions and very non-steep directions. What you really want is something that actually would go more like this, right? So how can we get closer to that? Introduce momentum. So one way to think of it is rather than always following the steepest direction, put the ball on your surface, which has some non-zero mass, and let it roll. And then it's less like it's going to go back and forth the way the gradient descent would, would actually roll more directly to the bottom, assuming there's some friction on your ball. The way you set this up is you say the direction, so V is the direction in which you move, the direction in which you move is not just the steepest direction, but it actually is computed here. It's the direction you had before, where mu is a forget factor. It's a number smaller than 1. You retain the direction in which you moved before, but you don't fully keep it. You take something a little smaller than that. And then you also adjust it with what currently is the steepest direction. Okay. 
When you do this, what will happen is, first, you might still move over here. Next, you don't just move all the way down here, because the previous time you moved up, so you retain some of that momentum, and actually you might end up, instead of moving all the way back down, you might end up somewhere here. In addition, in terms of moving off to the right, you are moving a bit to the right, you're again asked to move a bit to the right, so actually we'll accelerate in that direction, you actually might end up somewhere over here. So you might go from here to here, and so forth, getting to the minimum relatively quickly. It is true with the momentum, you actually might overshoot the minimum a little bit because you come in with some speed and then you have to turn around, but you get there uh, quicker than with gradient descent. If you want to do something even more advanced, the star here means that it is beyond the scope of what we expect you to know for this class. There are things called Nestor of Momentum Update, Atagrad, RMS Prop, Atom, LBFGS. Those are things you might want to look up if you're doing this in the real world and want to look at variants of what we covered so far. What are the remaining pieces? Next lecture we'll look at how to optimize more explicitly because we have a machine learning objective, how to exploit that. We'll look at how to improve generalization to hold out data beyond what we've seen so far. We'll look at different activation functions. We'll look at initialization, renormalization, and how to compute the gradient. We haven't seen how to do that computationally. For now, that's something you think you have to do by hand, but that's really difficult to do. We'll see how you can do it with a computer. Thank you. See you on Thursday.